We want to um, open our service in prayer tonight. If everyone would, let's stand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I tell you, the Lord met with us this morning, didn't he? In a powerful way. And I'm looking forward to him meeting with us again tonight. Brother Gary just informed me that Mark Russ, um, Mark and Tuesday that sit back here, that Mark's mother had a stroke, um, I believe Friday. And um, so we want to be praying for uh, Mrs. Russ and that the Lord would just minister to her. Also, um, Brother Clifford McGraw that pastored our church down here in King Street, um, I got word last week that he had a massive stroke, and we prayed for him in our, our Saturday night prayer meeting, and um, he actually called me Friday night, and so we just thank the Lord. He, they, it was very touch and go. He still needs a lot of prayer, but um, he is recovering, and so we want to um, continue to we want to pray for, for Brother Clifford McGraw. And also, we want to continue to pray for all of our brothers and sisters in Texas. Um, this is just something that I feel like the Lord wants us to keep before us. We don't want to forget about that tragedy. We don't want to forget about those folks. You know, as humans, when we hear about stuff like that, what's the first thing we thought about? Are we prepared? Are we prepared? Um, that, was, that was immediately our first thought. And we should be concerned about that, but at the same time, think about a pastor just lost half of his congregation, his own child. I understand it, one of his parents that also passed away. He, he, can you imagine the devastation? And that's just the pastor, and then everybody in that community, and all the people in that church. And so as we pray tonight, let's pray for them. Let's continue to pray for them. And I've been praying that the Lord would send pastors and prophets and apostles and evangelists and teachers and every office of the five-fold ministry into Texas and, and would speak blessings and, and encouragement to them. So we want to go to the Lord in prayer. You may have a request you'd like to make with an uplifted hand. Uh, my dad's nephew we just found today um, is filled with cancer. He's only 64 years old and um, his name is Larry Nell and we want to pray for, for him. Um, to my knowledge, he is not right with the Lord, but he's got a very godly sister, and, um, and he's, his dad was a preacher, and we just want to believe that Larry's going to be right with God before he leaves this world. I know God can heal him, but um, I would rather God take him now and him go to heaven than to live to be 100 and him go to hell. So, um, so we just want God's way to be done in, in Larry's life. But let me see that hand one more time. The Lord, yeah, Brother Eddie. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, let's remember um, Wanda's stepmother as well. So take each other by the hand as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you tonight on this Sunday evening on behalf of all the needs and the requests that are here tonight. Lord, I ask you to let the Holy Spirit have his way. Lord, let the Holy Spirit search the hearts of men and women tonight. Let the Holy Spirit do a work in their lives. And Lord, every hand that was raised, there was a need behind that hand, maybe several needs behind that hand. And Lord, I pray that your Spirit would search those and that you would, that you would do a work in each of those lives. And Lord, I also pray tonight for the requests that have been verbalized. We pray, Lord, for Sister Wanda Lynch, and we pray for her mother, her stepmother, Lord, tonight, that you would minister to her body and minister to her dad and Touch those in her family, Lord. Father, I pray your hand would be on them. And Lord, we also ask tonight for Mark Russ's mom. Lord, I know that you have the power to raise her up and deliver her out of this stroke condition. And Lord, I just put her in your hands, and I believe for her healing tonight. And Lord, I pray for Brother Clifford McGraw. I praise you first and foremost that the strength is returning to his body, and I just speak a complete healing over him tonight in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I also ask that you would minister um, to my cousin Larry tonight. Lord, I would love for you to heal Larry, but what's the most important thing to me is that Larry's life is right with you, that his heart is right with you. And Lord, I just pray that you will send somebody to him, whether it be his sister or somebody else, Lord, but send somebody to him that would lead him to Jesus and tell him of the way of salvation. And Lord, I'm sure he's been told the story many times, but let the Holy Spirit deal with his heart. Let him get right with you, God, that this life is but a vapor. The life to come is everlasting. And I'm asking you, God, to, to um, 
to save him. Lord, his dad was a, a preacher of the gospel, a lover of Jesus. You said to believe on you and we would be saved at our house. So I'm asking you, God, to invoke that principle into Larry's life tonight. And Lord, I pray for those in Texas who are a week out from this terrible tragedy. But Lord, a week is not a long time. They're, they're just in the beginning of the suffering and the pain. And Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, to let the Holy Spirit, who is the comforter, to comfort them tonight. Bring and bear comfort on them tonight. Pour comfort out on them tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen and amen. Remain standing as we worship and singing tonight. Praise the Lord. Come on, he's everlasting to everlasting. Strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait. Come on, strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Come on, our God. Our God. You reign forever. Strength will rise. Sing it out. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Come on, strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Come on, wait. I've got our God. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. Come on, you are, you see, you are the everlasting God, the everlasting God, you do not fade, you won't go the defender of me, you comfort those in me, you lift us up. Hallelujah. Are you thankful for an everlasting God? He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get weak. We can always call on Him. And He hears our prayer. Amen. And He's strong enough to answer that prayer. Amen. Praise the Lord. Give Him a hand clap of praise tonight. We're going to sing the chorus one more time. You are the everlasting God. Come on in worship tonight. You do not faint. You do not faint, you won't grow weary. 
stood a defender of the weak. You comfort, Lord. You comfort those in need. Lift us up. You lift us up, oh, we. Come on, one more time. You are. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not fade. You won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. Lift us up. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Praise the Lord. Give him a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. Well, welcome to Sunday night service. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. We're going to hear an awesome word tonight. We're going to have an awesome time of worship. Let's take a moment if we can. Get out of your seat. Shake someone's hand. Tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you for being here. Praise the Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Come on, I'm on. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. I'm on Come on, I'll try that first verse. My Lord. Happy. I was alone and idle. I was a sinner too. I heard a voice from heaven saying there is work to do. I took the master's hand and I joined that heavenly band. And I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Come on, we're working for it. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. Now I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Come on, pull that next verse up. I lost my flag in battle. My staff is in my head. I'm taking it to Jesus over in that glory land. In distant lands I've tried, cried, sinner, come to God. And I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Come on, sing it out. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Come on, one more time now. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise tonight. We're working for him. Praise Hallelujah. the Lord. Come on, let's give him praise tonight. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Amen. I was standing up here and I was scanning the, the crowd tonight looking for Miss Pam. I thought, I wonder if Miss Pam um, came tonight or if she stayed with Andrea. And then I spotted Andrea. And so we want to welcome Andrea back to church tonight. Give her a hand clap of welcome. And I still am in your great debt and in your gratitude. Is your, my gratitude belongs to you. But uh, we are just so happy for this new mama. And um, she, looks, she looks good to have delivered a nine-pound baby, hasn't she? Amen. And so we're just looking forward for Reed's um, first service. But we're glad to have Andrea back. You may be seated. Ushers, would you come? Let's get ready to wait on the people tonight for their uh, morning, uh, for their evening tithes and offerings. If you've not paid your tithes, this is a good opportunity to do so. And if you have, this is a great opportunity to sow some seed into the kingdom of God. And so we're going to give you the opportunity to worship the Lord in your giving tonight. I want to um, just kind of tell you about what the rest, the remainder of the uh, month is going to be since it is Thanksgiving month. Next Sunday, Sunday morning and Sunday night, I meant to mention this earlier in the service today, but we have got Adam Fulgham will be with us Sunday morning and Sunday night. Adam is the kid evangelist. I've talked to you. I've, I've mentioned him several times. He's 16, just turned 16, has been evangelizing since he was 13. And um, I, I'm telling you, I don't know that I've ever heard uh, any child um, that can hold a candle to him when it comes to preaching. He is just a fabulous preacher, has such a depth of the word. And um, you'll, you'll think you're listening to a 60-year-old man in a 16-year-old body. And um, he can play and sing, play piano and sing. And so um, we're going to enjoy him next Sunday. Of all the um, speakers we've had over the process of this year, I think he is the one I'm the most excited about having. And so he's going to be with us Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, we're going to be back here for our um, district Thanksgiving service. And so we're going to have diff the churches from around the district will be gathered here after church that night. We're going to be having soup and cornbread over in the, um, in the gym. And so all the churches will be bringing different types of soup, and we'll be having cornbread, and it's just going to be a great night. And I think some of our ladies are going to be doing desserts. And so it's going to be a great, did you not know that? I'm announcing it to you now. <laughs> One week. Hey, one week's notice is a lot. I don't usually give her nearly that much. It's usually like, hey, can you cook for a funeral win today? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they don't give us a lot of notice when they die now, you know. So, so um, But anyways, that'll be next Sunday night. And then the following week is Thanksgiving week, so there'll be no midweek service um, that week. And then the following Sunday, we'll be having service here on Sunday morning. And then on Sunday night, we will be at the Bean Market for a community revival. And, and Dr. Terry Trammell will be preaching that evening. And um, Dr. Trammell is the one that I'm preaching. His, he's, he and I are preaching to you together on Wednesday night. It's his message that I told you was, I was so moved by that I've been um, working from his material for our Wednesday night study. And so um, you'll get to hear the real Dr. Trammell in person on Sunday night, um, November the 26th. And so I encourage you to be part of that meeting. It's going to be a great, great time. So let's give unto the Lord tonight and just let the Lord bless us as we give. Father, we thank you tonight for your wonderful gift, the gift of salvation, the gift of Jesus. And then on top of that incredible gift, you gave us the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then with him, you gave us nine more gifts. And so, Lord, you're just a gift giver. And then on top of that, you renew us with mercies every day. So, God, you're a gift giver. So, Lord, we want to give to you tonight, just to give back to you to say thank you, Lord, for the way you've done and given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place when we all, when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Sing and shout 
the victory while we walk the pilgrim's pathway clouds will over spread the sky but when traveling days are over not a shadow not come on a let's stand to our feet tonight when we all come on get up on your feet tonight what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Hallelujah. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the souls of life repay when we all, when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Come on, joy. Onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will be. Hallelujah. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Come on, when we all, when we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. We'll sing and shout. We'll sing and shout the victory. We'll sing and shout the victory. Praise the Lord. Hey Amen. Would you give the team a good hand clap, an expression of thanks, and give praise to the Lord tonight? Aren't they doing a great job? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. They never cease to amaze me how God uses them. And this morning's worship service was so, so great. Um, and Blake did such a great job on that song this morning, that new song. Um, I, he, he had sent that to me earlier, and he said, um, I could tell it was one of those that just had ministered to him. And so um, you could tell the way that he sung this morning, it ministered to him, and in, the, in return, it ministered to us. And so I thank the Lord for that. Thank God for the anointing that was in this house this morning, the anointing that is in this house tonight. We have a treat tonight. I want to have asked that Brother Chris Britt would come and he would share with us tonight a, a message on encouragement. Um, Chris is a guy that you, you just don't know all that he does. Um, not only does he play the drums, that's all you see him do, but um, he has been an incredible worker of the ministry. He works in visitation. Um, he has um, d done such a fabulous job seeing our older people, checking on our, our older saints, and being there for them, praying with them. And um, I just thank the Lord. He is, he is a great asset to us and to this church. And um, he has a, a call on his life. He comes from a great heritage of ministry. And so I want you to put your hands together and welcome him tonight as he comes and breaks the bread of life. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. It's an honor and a privilege to, to speak here once again, to be called upon. Pastor Tim called us up and said, we'd like you to speak. And uh, I was very much appreciative of 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 his his offer and the, the type of pastor that he is, he's one that he shares this pulpit a lot, and he gives other ministers a chance to, to deliver the word. And there's a lot of ministers who won't do that uh, for various reasons. They they will not share their pulpit. So I appreciate him and that he is the type of pastor who will do so. 
And it, it is a blessing to me every time I, I get to stand behind a, 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 a pulpit or a podium and, and speak and preach the word of God. Uh, we've been fortunate to do that a lot for my dad in Aner. Be praying for him as he'll be having some, some traumatic surgery on December the 5th. Uh, to his whole abdomen, so we'll just be praying for him, and uh, we're, we're hoping for a speedy recovery because we just found out that Aner will be asking us to fill in there for a while, for a couple weeks while he's recovering, so we're praying that he will recover quickly, and they told him that he, they, they love him a lot, they told him he did not need to be 100%, they love his preaching so much, they said, you preacher, you can preach from, from a, a sitting down position, we don't mind it at all, so they're a loving church, and they love him, and uh, they also love us, and we'll be filling in for him. So that is a blessing. So uh, Pastor Tim, he said, Chris, I'd like for you to, to preach on uh, the subject matter of encouragement. And he would have been so proud because I had this sermon. We, we were conversing, and I had this sermon on my heart, my mind, and I began writing it all out. I'd had bits and pieces come in different areas, and I had typed it all out. It was so pretty. It was the notes were just amazing. And I got on the tree stand yesterday afternoon. I, I like to hunt. And it was almost as if I was looking at those notes, and I was very proud of them. And it was like the Lord looked over my shoulder, and he said, well, ain't that pretty? I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, you ain't preaching that. I was like, oh. <laughs> really? Ouch. So um, last night we got off of that deer stand, and we went home, and we started working on the sermon that we're going to deliver to you today, and uh, we're getting older. We turned 40 just a few weeks ago, and uh, on the way here, I'm, I'm a great magician, but only to myself. I could not do an illusion that you would appreciate, but I, I can make my stuff disappear all the time. My car keys, my wallet, everything, just I lose it, and I could have it in my hand, and it just disappears. And so I was looking for keys and phone and everything to come and made sure I had my big Bible because I can't hardly see anymore. And uh, I had my big Bible and I got here and uh, Sam was the first person I saw and she looked at me and looked at her and I said, I forgot my notes. And so I began, uh, she said, oh really? So God has a, a wonderful sense of humor, but um, I do have all of my uh, notes that I, I tried to hurry up and get while we were waiting for practice. But, you know, when it comes down to the Lord, he has a way of qualifying who he calls. And it was his way of telling me, listen, I don't need no pretty fancy outline and sermon description. What I need for you is to get in the right place with your heart to deliver the sermon I've already given you. You already know everything that you're going to say. You don't need to be worried about your notes and your outlines. You need to be comfortable. So I went and I I'm, I, he, he was expressing that to me earlier. I got out of the suit, and I got into something I could feel good about moving around in. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you first to turn, and I'm looking at my phone because there's my notes. I'm not checking Facebook, I promise. Uh, if, you, if, if you would, turn to Matthew 22 and 37. We're going to be jumping around just a little bit. So if you get, when you get there, just tell me, amen, and that'll be my, my knowledge that you got there. Matthew 22 and 37. Amen. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Now, if you would, flip over to Revelations. All the way in the back. Chapter 2, verse 5. I mean, excuse me, verse 2, 1 through 5. And I'm getting there too. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. I'd like to speak to you tonight on a sermon that 
I've entitled The Heart Art of Encouragement. I began thinking of this without even realizing that the other day, my, my children, we listen to a lot of music because we have a long distance that we travel. And mostly we listen to gospel music, but my oldest son heard this song that on a movie that he fell in love with, and it's the old, old song, Barbara Ann. And if you were to wake me up in the middle of 2 o'clock in the morning, I've heard this song repeated in my car so many times, I'll probably be singing it. it Bob, Bob Aran. I think it was the Beach Boys or somebody like that. Well, anyway, my phone was playing Bob Aran for the 50th time on that commute, and uh, it automatically went to another song. It's this application, and, and, and there was a song that played. It was by the Righteous Brothers, and it brought back memories of my childhood. Not that I was a child when it came out, but I'd listened to that song, and the song that came on was You've Lost That Loving Feeling. I don't know if y'all remember that one, but I remember listening to it. My granddaddy, he only listened to gospel music. And he said, what's that in there? I said, it's okay, daddy. It's the right, uh, grandpa, it's the righteous brothers. I was wanting to make, <laughs> they're, they're the righteous brothers. So it's okay because they're the righteous brothers. I, I, I think they're a gospel quartet, maybe. I don't know. But, uh. <laughs> Learned to lie at a young age. We repented for that, though. But uh, I just figured, you know, he bought it, too. <laughs> oh, okay. And he kept wind rocking. I turned it down so the lyrics weren't apparent. But uh, you've lost that love and feeling. And right here, we're, we're, we're speaking of the church of Ephesus. And what's being spoken to them it was very prophetic to me. I began to do some research last night about the church of Ephesus and what was going on during that period of time? What were they facing? Um, a couple of things I found out about uh, of Ephesus. It was a flourishing city, one of the biggest cities of its time with a population of about 225,000 people. That was a lot for a city, especially back in those days. And, and it possessed like a huge harbor. It would remind you of like the harbor of New York City. It was a center of trade. Uh, the harbors could... could could take any ships that were built in that time. It could, it could accommodate them. So there was a lot of trade that went through there. Uh, it, the residents were Greek, and the Greeks uh, were one who worshipped Diana. In fact, uh, one of the largest, the seven the ancient seven largest wonders of the world was the church dedicated to Diana there. And it was one of the, the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so Diana was the goddess of, uh, according to the Greeks, of uh, fertility, life, and reproduction. And uh, because of that, their lifestyles, the church in Ephesus was facing a lot of outside pressure. They were steadily at work. There were those who were trying to take the word and, and change the word and, and break it and, and pervert it. And they were working diligently and, and heavily, steadily to keep the doctrine sacred to keep the word pure, and there was all these outside sources of just uh, sexual immorality that was going on during the time, and I began thinking about this day and age, and I said, Lord, every time I turn on the TV, yes, we're, we're living in a country of great prosperity, but there's all of these outside forces that are, that are pressing in, and, and I, I noticed the one part of, of what was being said in Revelations 2, and he's saying, I know you have worked, you've labored, you, you've even made sure that the false prophets haven't perverted the word, and you, and you've, but you've lost your first love. And I began to think about the consequences of that. See, I can remember back in the day of falling in love for the first time. And maybe some of you in here, the first time you fell in love was the person who's to your left or to your right. But I remember what it was like. There was an excitement when you first fall in love. There was, there was an excitement. You wanted to, to be with that person all the time. There was nothing that you wouldn't do for that person. You were just anxious to get from one date to the next. Life in between being with that person was just so you could get to be with that person again. Amen? I don't know if you can remember that, but I can remember what it was like in high school to stuff those letters inside of a locker. I can remember what it was like going on that dating process and just, I remember my grandmother said one time, we were saying uh, grace and, I, and I, I held her close and she said to me, she said, 
well, don't eat her before we say grace. I love the grandma, but that was the way you were. You just, I've heard that expression. You love them so much you could just eat them up. You love them so, so much. And you have those phone calls that you're talking one to one another over the phone, and, and, and you end it like, well, I love you. Well, I love you more. I love you most. You hang up. No, you hang up first. No, no, you hang up first. No, you, na- you hang up first. No, you hang up. And it goes back. I don't know if y'all remember this kind of stuff, but it was that you're just in love, so in love. And so many relationships start out like that, but something happens. You lose that love and feeling. It, you become almost too familiar with that person. I remember my dad saying, whatever it takes to win is what it will take to keep them. You have to keep courting for the rest of your life, for the rest of your marriage. Ladies, can we say amen? Amen. We have, we have to keep courting. We have to keep dating. And I began to think about our relationship with Christ and what it looks like when we first find Christ in the altar. We first find Christ in the altar, and we're so happy. We're, we're, we're just so full of joy. We're so full of happiness. We can't wait to tell everybody that we can come in contact with. We're so anxious to tell them about it. And then we, we, we can't wait to go to church. When you first get saved, it's almost like every time the church doors open, I want to be there. And even when they're not open, I want to find another church that might be having revival, and I want to go to it. I want to be wherever the Lord is because my life consists of being with Him, and everything in between is just what it takes for me to get to the next time I can come into His presence. Our prayer life, we're on our knees talking to God so much. We have that relationship that's so close, and with every breath that we, we can draw in, we're thinking about Him. Even on our job, it's hard for us to concentrate sometimes because our minds are so on the Lord and we're, we're so in love with him and then something happens there's a gradual familiarity that begins to come into the relationship we become over familiar with him and it's at moments that like that the relationship becomes more sparse just like in relationships between husbands and wives you get bogged down in the business of the relationship The paying of the bills, the cutting the grass, the washing of the cars, the the cleaning of the house, the taking care of the kids. These things, all of a sudden, you almost become just passing ships in the night. Some even grow to be strangers. And so I began to think about this this familiarity and and what what does it mean to be able to be encouraged? It all starts with the heart. It all starts with the relationship. There is no one who can encourage you in the Lord more than yourself. But when you find your your heart absent of the Lord, there's a barrier that comes between you because you do not have open lines of communication with Him. You don't have that relationship. How can you be encouraged in the Lord if you're not having a relationship with the Lord? It's impossible. And, and I look around and I say, you know, when you, when you first get saved, there's, there's nothing. When, when you're in love with someone the first time, you will spare no expense. You will spend the entire paycheck. You will put so, many, so much money down on that diamond ring because you want to make her, her yours. Four, five, six thousand dollars on a ring. You will get anything for her. You will do anything for her. Same here in church. You want to do everything when you first get saved. You want to volunteer. You want to be active. You want to be a part. And then all of a sudden, that relationship gets strained. And nobody wants to come to church on a Sunday night. I'm not preaching to you. You're here. But I can tell you that the Sunday morning crowd and the Sunday night crowd are a whole lot different. In fact, even in our own conference, people, you know, there's churches saying, well, maybe we shouldn't have church on Sunday nights. And maybe we shouldn't have church on Wednesday nights. And there's a heart problem. There's a heart problem within our churches there's a heart problem within our, our country, within our community, within our churches, within our families. There's a heart problem. And it's easy to understand how we can become discouraged as a result of that. I would like for you to turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 30. I want to read to you about David. And it came to pass 
When David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that they were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no, no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. I want you to draw a line right there. So often we find ourselves as David did. Now, David was one who, was, who had been anointed to be king. He had been anointed. He knew he was anointed to do the work and the will of God. Yet David finds himself in this situation where everybody has turned against him. They're talking about stoning him. His wives are gone. His children are gone. His house, his kingdom, gone. Well, at that time, he had before this been living in caves, running from Saul. He finally gets a place to call his own. And all of a sudden, what he has acquired, it's all gone. Gone. I began to think of times in my life where I've been right there. Right there. I can remember I was in New Jersey, and I got a telephone call. And my dad was to have, had just had surgery on that Friday. And it was a Monday, midday. And I got a phone call at work saying I needed to get in touch with my mom. There was a problem. And I remember calling my mother. And she said, there's been a problem while your dad was in surgery, no one knew it, but they nicked his intestine, and he's been leaking septic into his system since midday Friday, and this was Monday. Your daddy is on life support. They did emergency surgery. You need to come home. They don't know whether he's going to live or die. My dad was very young. This is going back 2001. That kind of thing had never occurred to me. And I'd love to tell you I was at the closest walk of my life with, with Jesus, but I wasn't. I wasn't there. But I had been before. And I remembered, even though I wasn't where I was, I hit my knees and I began to pray. I didn't even make it out of my job before I prayed. I finally got enough courage to get in the car and to drive. I got a plane ticket just as soon as I could, which was that day. I had to get to the plane. And the whole time, I felt the, the Spirit of the Lord come upon me. And I knew if I could just make it there, my dad would be okay. And I remember flying into Florence. I, I flew right out of a JFK into Florence. And I remember I got off the plane, and I was picked up uh, by a family friend to drive me there to the hospital where my mom was, my sister was, and my little baby brother. He was, well, he's not little and a baby anymore. He's, he's big, well, he's still a baby. But, um, <laughs> but I remember I got there in the waiting room, and here's some of the church people who my dad has pastored. And I walked in. And I remember hearing what was being said. It was only a handful. But I remember one was saying, it doesn't look good. They were in the corner talking, it doesn't look good. And he looks really badly. And they were describing how he looked. And my mom was shaken up. 
And my little baby brother, he was, in 2001, he was about 9, 10, somewhere in there. And he said, I don't, Daddy looks good. Daddy looks good. He was looking through different eyes. He was looking through the eyes of a child. All I wanted to do was go in there, and I, I began walking into ICU. And the doctor caught me, and he said, listen, you can't talk to your dad when you go in there. His vitals are, are very fragile right now. We can't have them fluctuate. You, we can't allow you to even speak to him. Um, promise that you won't speak to him. And I said, I won't speak to him. And so my sister came into the room behind me. And I looked at Amanda. I said, told her to go to the other side of the bed. And she said, why? I said, because we're going to pray. And she said, they told us not to talk to him. I said, I'm not going to talk to him. I'm going to talk to him. I told my sister, I said, you give me both of your hands. You stretch them out over my dad's body. And I grabbed both of our hands and the Holy Spirit came down in the middle of that hospital room, and I began to speak in tongues, and I could feel the Spirit. And I walked out of that room not care, having a care in the world. I knew exactly what was going to happen when it came to my father. I had no doubt. I had an immediate confirmation that came into my soul, and I walked out. I, knowing, I could turn my back knowing everything was going to be just fine. And I remember I walked back to that, to that room, and it wasn't 10 minutes that had passed there was one of the nurses who came in, and she looked at my mother, and she said, Miss Britt. And my mom said, that's me. And she walked over there to my mama, and she grabbed her by the arm, and she said, Miss Britt, I don't know how to tell you this. And my mom swooned. She was thinking that bad words were going to come. And she grabbed her, and she said, no, Miss Britt, no, Miss Britt. It's not bad. She said, we don't know how this happened. And she began to try to explain this to my mother, who was just wanting to know what was going on. And she said, Miss Britt, your husband has the ventilator tube that is down into his lungs. It's something that can't be coughed out. It inflates on the inside, and it breathes for you. She said, and his hands are tied to the bed. The reason why we do that is because he doesn't know what's going on, and we don't want him to pull it out or pull on anything. So his hands are tied. She said, but we just went in there five minutes ago. His hands are still tied, and it was out of his body, laying on his chest, and he's breathing on his own. <laughs> hey, man. He's breathing on his own. My grandmother, the Church of God lady that she was, pastor's wife, all she was, she got excited, started shouting all over that place. I was crying, and this nurse was looking like, what in the world is going on in this place? I, she might have been Methodist or Lutheran, but she hadn't seen nothing like that. And so my grandma began to tell her in between the spirit speaking out of her and said, baby, I can tell you how that happened. My Lord Jesus Christ took that out of my boy. That's how that happened, sweetheart. And I can remember that. And I would love to tell you that ever since then, it hasn't been a battle, but there's been a battle, and my dad's got another surgery lined up. I think he's had 17. But here's David. David is in this situation, and we got to the part halfway through verse 6, where it says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. There's the colon, but, but God. I love every time in the Bible I get to a part where it says, but, because everything ch changes, everything turns on a 180 in, in, in the, after the but. Here it is, this is a situation, everything that can happen bad happen, and then there's a but. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Nobody came to David. There wasn't a prophet. He didn't have his, his child to hold his hand, to speak an encouraging word. He didn't have his wife to say anything good to him. He had nothing but people who wanted to stone him. There was not a pastor for him to call. There was no one there. David had to encourage himself. Amen? And David said to Abathar, 
the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake him? To overtake them. What did David do? David realized the importance of two things. He was getting his heart back in order. He was saying, I need to pray. I need to talk to him. He recognized at that moment what he needed to do. He needed to pray. He needed to talk to God. And he needed what? An answer. David did not act. He didn't do anything except hit his knees and pray for the answer. What does it say happened after that? And he answered him, Pursue, for, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. 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 He didn't say you would get a little bit back. He said you're going to get it all. All back. All. God is the God of restoration, but there's a process that it takes to get to restoration. It starts with getting the heart right. Before we get our heart right, we're just spinning our wheels because we're doing everything in the way that we would do it. Here's David in this situation and he hits his knees and he's praying to God and saying, what do I do? I believe that David was at that point, if God said, go home, he would have went home. He said, if he just said, camp right there for three years, he would have camped right there for three years. If he said, go and give those, those enemies your flocks, give them the rest. of He would have done what, at that moment whatever God would have told him to do. That is what David would have done at that moment. But here we find ourselves in, in our situations. We're in our dark situations, and we, we want to tell God somehow, sometimes how it's supposed to go. God isn't Burger King. You don't have it your way. It is his way, and only his way. And until we get our mind, it is not that God's will is aligned to us. It is our will who has to be aligned to God. We can't do it our way. I don't care if you stayed in the Holiday Inn last night and think that you're intelligent enough to, to, to take the wheel of your car. It shouldn't be you driving in the, in, the, in the first place. And we wonder so many times why we end up in places we end up is because we're the one doing the driving. If we would get out of the driver's seat and get our heart back in line, we might would find ourselves in church on Sunday night and Wednesday night doing things that kept us out of situations that we shouldn't be in. And it might have been that somebody else in our families would have saw something in us that saw that kind of commitment in our lives who would say, I want to strive to be like that instead of where they were on Friday night when they got into that accident because they'd been drinking. Amen? I know, I know I'm saying things that are, that are not easy to hear, but I'm preaching to me. Because it ain't just me walking there. There's people who's looking at me in my life. I'm a living testimony. What I'm doing on Sunday night means something. Not only to my life, but those who are watching me. Amen? I have two little boys who watch what I do. I have family members who watch what I do. And when I get my steps in line, it's not just mine who come in line. It's anybody in my household and those who see what I am. That's the importance of what we do and why we do it. Because it is the right way to do things. Amen? So I'm sitting here and I begin thinking about this. And it's just amazing when you, when you read after that. So David, what does David do? He immediately does exactly what God told him to do. What does he say? And David went and he had the 600 men that were with him. And came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 men abode behind, which were so faint they could not go over the brook Besor. What happened immediately? He lost a third. He lost a third immediately after God said, do this. Don't think that when God tells you to do something that you're not going to come upon an obstacle. Amen? So many times we, we get motivated to do something for God, and then all of a sudden the, the enemy comes out and he pops us with a left hook and we stop dead in our tracks. And we don't go any forward, any more forward after that. We just stay right there. That's not what God is intending us to do. He needs to make sure that we are committed. Yeah. 
that we're going to keep pushing no matter what the obstacle is. And what happens after that? And they found just so happened, right? And they just so happened to find an Egyptian in the field. And brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water, and they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And, said, and David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, surgeon to a, 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 a Malachite, and my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither, neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee, down, uh, bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad, abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save 400 men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away and David rescued his two wives and there was nothing lacking to them neither small nor great neither anything that they had taken to them David recovered all three times three times it says David recovered all anytime I see anything in the Bible stated three times in, in quick sequence it's important We've gotten too complacent with not recovering all. When the enemy has come in and stolen from us and taken, we've gotten so complacent where we're saying, well, let me get adjusted to what just happened. We don't need to get adjusted to any of that. The Bible tells me I shouldn't fear anything that Satan has. The only one I should fear is the author of this word right here. This is the only person I should fear. Yet we fear and we get into those states of depression and anxiety and frustration. And it eats at us like a cancer when all the while the answers are staring us right here. Amen? We don't need Dr. Phil to tell us how to get out of our situation. I don't need a shrink to tell me how to get out of this situation. The answers are all right here. Amen? I don't need Zoloft. I don't need Prozac. I don't need Xanax. I don't need any of that. What I need is right here. Right here. Dr. Jesus can take care of it all. Amen? So I'm sitting here, and I begin to think of the Ephesians, going back to the Ephesians, and I have several verses of Scripture that are all saying the same thing. But here, the same situation is explained right back to Ephesians. If you'll turn me with Ephesians 3 and 16. And I'm going to be coming to a close soon. Which absolutely means nothing. Amen. I guess this is my first close. And it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit. The, in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye be rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all, that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all the ages without uh, through all the ages world without end amen since we're in Ephesians I can flip through these quick if you flipped over to chapter 6 verse 10 finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spir spiritual weaknesses, wi wickedness in high places. And then over in Ephesians 4, 7, uh, set verses 17 through 20. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. What is, these, what, what is this saying? It's saying that when we're in these situations, if we're looking with carnal eyes and carnal minds and carnal spirits, we're not going to figure it out. What is, the, what, are, what is being said here is we can't, he's saying, don't be like the Gentiles who, who don't know, who wander around aimlessly. We get in these situations and we try to figure it out, and it is not for us to figure it out. It's for us to pray and wait on the answer, but we get so anxious, we get so nervous, we, we get so impatient. But David is the, the, the example that I wanted to, to bring to you tonight of what we have to do in order to find the encouragement and find the answer. And, and if you would, um, I'm going to have my second close out of the book of Psalms. If you turn over to, to the book of Psalms, and I had to share these two. Um, chapter uh, 138. Because I've been here. I know what it's like to turn around and your family's gone. I know what it's like to turn around and your children be gone. I know what it's like to turn around and your house be gone. I know what it's like to turn around and your job be gone. Turn around and your health is gone. I know what it's like when the enemy doesn't storm one gate, but he surrounds your whole city. I've been there in the floor crying, prostrate on the ground, begging God, begging him just to make the pain stop. I've been there where I went out grocery shopping, and my grocery list consisted of a bag of rice. That was what I got. I was too proud to say anything to anybody. But that was in that situation because rice makes a whole lot of feeling. I began to cook rice. I remember being in the situation in that home that I was in that I was struggling so hard to keep. I remember unplugging everything except the refrigerator, which I didn't even understand why I had it on because all there was was rice. But I figured it would break or something. An alarm clock, and in one room I had a heater, and I kept that one room warm. And I've never been one, I had a, a dog that lived in the house with me, and I've never been one to let her jump on furniture on the bed, but one night she jumped on the bed and she was warm and I wasn't, I let her stay right there. And that's where I was. But I didn't stay there. I didn't stay there. I began speaking to God, searching God, praying to God and he began to minister to me not only through my own encouragement but there was other people who dropped things into me Psalms 138 was was a verse that I'd a chapter I'd written and marked down because someone told me that God had told them to give it to me it says I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods I will sing praise unto thee I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy love and kindness for thy truth for thou hast magnified the word above all thy name. In the day when I cried out, thou answered me and strengthenest me and will strengthen in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of my mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. But the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Another person gave me Psalms 3, verse 3.
And in the same day I stumbled, I was listening to, to some gospel music. And it just so happened, they told me to read Psalm 3. And I began listening to some gospel music. And Georgia Mass was singing this song. From out of this psalm, it says, Lord, how they are increased that trouble me. Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which, which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried out unto the Lord my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awakened for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. They have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. I began in that moment to, to think. And it's something that we forget. Pastor said something so profound this morning. He said, when we sit in situations, and he asked everybody, if you're going through something, raise your hand. And there was hands raised everywhere. And he said, if you're going through something, raise your hand. And almost all of the same hands were raised across the church. And we began to sing the song. And what was noted was, listen, we might be going through stuff, but he's already delivered us from, from things in the past. I'm going through something right now. But in that moment, I began recalling things. I've been recalling when they told my mother that my brother, when he was in the womb, would be we born with Down syndrome. That the left ventricle of his head was twice the size and he was born perfectly fine. I, I began to think of a lot of things. And when I was laying on that floor prostrate, I re had remembered something that happened to me when I was diagnosed with swine flu. I was diagnosed with swine flu. I was brought into the hospital, and I was a sick, sick man. There was some people who had died from that swine flu that year, and I had a bad case of it. And I remember everybody separated themselves from me. My mom and dad called and said, baby, we love you, but we can't come see you. We can't risk getting to swine flu. My wife was gone. Everybody was gone, and it was just me. The room I was in didn't have a window. And I remembered them giving me medicine and coming in and out of my system, and the pain was, was unreal. I never felt so sick in my life. My stomach felt like somebody had just ripped it out of me. And I remember being so lonely. I was, I was sitting there crying. I didn't even know if I was going to live or die. I felt like I was going to die. And I would come to, and I would go out, and I would come to, and, and I would go out. And I remember I was sitting there in that, in that room, and I realized, I, and I spoke out loud in that room to, to the void, and I said, God, I'm not alone. It may look like I'm alone, but I know that you're here with me. And I began to pray, and then I began doing something else, which came out of the book of Matthew, and this song was written in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 26. It says, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that thou shalt not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that ye speak light, and what you hear in the ear, that preach it upon you, upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear them which is able to destroy both the soul and the body. And here's the part that stuck out. And not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all, all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more valued than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, I will confess him also before my Father which is in heaven. And I remembered last month I had a, a death of Miss Eloise Smith. She was a lady who kept me. When I was little, my mama worked a lot. And she was a black lady. And I loved her like a mama, and she loved me like a son, and she taught me this song. And I remember I was in that hospital room all by myself, and I began to sing, and I said, Why should I feel discouraged? And why 
Do the shadows come? Why does my heart feel lonely and long for my heavenly home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eyes are on the sparrow, and I know that he watches over me, cause his eyes are on the little sparrow. Oh, and I know he watches over me. And I began feeling something happening inside of my body at that moment. And I started singing even more. And I said, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes are on the sparrow. And I know. He watches over me. I can tell you a nurse immediately came into there, into that room. And she walked in and she was looking wide-eyed. And I said, I'm sorry. I didn't know what time it is. I was just singing. I didn't know. Is, did I wake anybody? I'm sorry. She said, baby, no. I was just surprised to come in here and not see a brother. Because she was a black lady and I was in this white skin of mine. And so I began singing, and she, she came in, and I got to witness to her. And I've been to these places so many times. And when I find myself so discouraged, all I know to do is to go back to those times. And I began using those times that God, every single time, has walked me through. He's never let me go. There's been times I've turned and walked away from him, but he never walked away from me. And every single time I've seen him deliver, and that's all I know, and I don't know any better. This country boy don't know anything better than God. All I know is that he answers prayer. All I know is that he delivers. And although I'm not at the finish line where I wanted to be at the age of 40 when I turned it last October the 8th that just passed, I know that 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 I will recover all. Amen. If you would stand to your feet. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing. But I do know who will be here at this altar if you need him. I know who will come and be there when your mother won't answer the phone or your dad's not there to answer the phone or your brother and sister are not there to answer the phone. I know that there's a person who will be there who will listen to you at any time of the night, at any place you find yourself in this world. And his name is Jesus. And if you need him tonight... There is an altar right here. If you have troubles, there is an altar right here. And I'm going to tell you, when you get your heart where it needs to be, you will find the encouragement lies right inside of you. Because he will encourage you when you turn to him. You won't need a pat on the back. You won't need that phone call. You won't need anything but Jesus himself. Because he's the one who said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll be there with you until the end. Amen. If you would bow your heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the presence that we feel, God. We know that it is you who walks with us. We know that you never leave us, God. And we thank you for all the blessings that you poured on our lives, Lord. We thank you for so many times when you spoke peace to our turmoil and peace to our seas that are troubled, God. And we know that you are able to do all things, and through Christ, we can do all things. So we know that we don't have to limit our prayers, God. We don't have to become complacent to our circumstances and try to acclimate to that which is disturbing us, God. We just have to hit our knees and get our heart right and renew that relationship with you and that joy of the first love. Help that first love become even more real in our lives than it has ever been, God. Help that passion burn so within us. Because God, not only is it the key to our lives, it could be keys to those who are on the outside looking in for the difference, something, a light in the darkness, God. We ask, Lord, that you not allow a single person in here to leave as they came. Allow them to be changed in such a way that they would burn 
a little bit brighter each day. With all heads bowed and, and eyes closed, and I know I've preached, but I've been preaching to myself all night long. But I'm sure the way that it goes, I've heard about a lot of preachers that say, preach on yourself, and you'll be preaching on other people too. Maybe you're there. Maybe you, if, if you're going through something, can I see your hands? If you're going through some trials and tribulations, can I see your hands? Mine's there. But you're not walking through them alone. And maybe you're going through some, some tough times, but I can tell you that you're not alone. If there's any who would, who would, who would like to come to this altar, the altar's open. Pastor's here to pray for you, and I'll pray with you. Would there be one? If not, all we have to know is that we don't have to be right here. We can be anywhere and call on his name. We don't have to be in front of the, the preacher or a congregation. It helps. But he's with us anywhere. Amen. In our home, in our car, in the middle of the woods. He's with us anywhere. Amen. Pastor. Wow, what a message. What a message. I wonder if, if you have a pulse, would you mind coming to the altar? Um, if you don't have a pulse, stay right where you are. But if you have a pulse, would you mind just coming to the altar? Maybe those that are here praying, you wouldn't mind praying with them. But what a word from the Lord tonight. I believe that God has spoken and addressed us tonight from his almighty word. Praise God. Praise God. That we can encourage ourselves in the Lord. I love that passage, that story. We shall recover it all. We shall recover it all. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Chris, if the word didn't touch anybody else tonight, it touched me. Man, I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged in the Lord tonight. I'm encouraged through the word of God tonight. Sometimes I felt like David, where I lost it all, and even the few men I had to go get it back, part of them left me. <laughs> but we recovered it all, and we're going to recover it all. And Sister Daisy was walking out the door today. She said, Pastor, I got a word for you. She held back, and she grabbed hold of me. She said, there's been some folks that have left, and she said they left because of this. She said, but the Lord's going to, they're, they're going to, she said, they're going to start coming back. You're going to recover them. I said, well, let, I only want them to come back with a right heart and a right spirit. <laughs> Amen. I believe that all that, all that we've lost, we're going to recover it all. I, this was a confirming word to me tonight. All that we've lost, we're going to recover it all. Father, we thank you tonight for the word of the Lord. I thank you for the servant of God. Lord, Chris has not preached from a classroom understanding. Lord, he's lived this. And Lord, it was evident as he spoke tonight and he gave us both the examples of the Bible and his own personal examples going all the way back as a young man where he watched the Lord move in the life of his family all the way back to his baby brother who is here tonight and not only was born perfect, but also born with so much talent and so much ability. That that the doctor said was completely erased and Lord, you have granted us with one that has so much gifting, so much gifting, so much anointing on his life. Lord, thank you for Chris sharing that with us tonight and Lord, what he did for his dad and what he's done for Chris. Lord, I, I received that along with what David did in recovering it all. Lord, I believe tonight, I'm standing tonight for my family, 
for my wife, for my kids, but also, Lord, I'm standing tonight for Lake City Pentecostal Holiness Church. God, today, for the first time in a while, I feel like my eyes have been opened to what you're about to do. God, I've, I've felt discouraged in my spirit, but today, today, along with last Sunday, but, but especially today, Lord, there has been such an encouraging spirit in this house. And I encourage myself in the Lord. But God, I've been encouraged by the Word of God tonight. And I thank you, Lord, we're going to recover it all. Not some, not most, not part. But we're going to recover it all. All that we have lost, Lord, we're going to recover it. And it's going to be better than it's ever been. And it's going to be greater than it ever was. And I thank you for that tonight. Thank you for the word of the Lord. Thank you for the prophetic word that has been spoken tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Go and recover it all. Amen. Amen.